everybody and, and welcome and I am honored to introduce you to Stephanie Davis with the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. Delighted to have you. We're honored to, honored to have you today, Stephanie. Uh, as a bit of an uh, overly brief introduction to everyone, uh, the NHLBI is the global leader for research and training and education focusing on prevention and treatment in, on, in heart, lung and, and blood disorders. I guess that's probably why you named yourself the uh, NHLBI, I suppose, Stephanie. I think you're anyway. on to something there, Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Anyway, the um, uh, the focus is, is transformative, uh, commercially viable prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, obviously. You're also part of the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination, and maybe you can explain that a little bit more clearly to us uh, uh, when you're on. So um, I'm really honored to introduce uh, you, uh, and um, I'll hand the baton over to you. You are... Uh, you're, you're actually, Stephanie, part of the Office of Translational Alliances and, and Coordination as well, Division of that Extra. You're, we, okay, <laughs> terrific. So uh, the, uh, you're on, Stephanie, and thank you so much indeed. It's terrific to have you join us. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Misty. Hi, everyone. Um, it looks like there's two of me here, so please ignore uh, my doppelganger down at the bottom of the screen. But it's so great to talk to you all today. And I'm just going to be giving everyone a little bit of a background about what the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute is focused on for its small business programs. And I'm also going to touch on a little bit about what the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination does. So let's just see if I can share my screen. All right. All right. All right. So I just wanted to give an overview of NHLBI, Small Business uh, Innovation Research and Small Tech Transfer Research Programs. Um, I am the current Small Business Program Coordinator in the NHLBI office. And my email is stephanie.davis3 at nih.gov. If you have any further questions that you'd like to contact me about after this presentation, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. So for those of you in the audience, if you're not familiar with the SBIR and STTR programs, I'm just going to give a little bit of background. So both the Small Business Innovation Research and the Small Business Tech Transfer Research programs are congressionally mandated. And they are required for all federal agencies that conduct research and development and have um, have a budget that is either greater than 100 million for the SBIR programs or greater than 1 billion in the case of the STTR programs. And the main goal of these programs is that they are going to provide grant funding for small business concerns that are engaging in research and development and developing novel technologies that are aligned with the mission of the federal agency. So in the case of the NIH, we tend to fund biotech, pharma, medical device companies that are developing new treatments, uh, devices, diagnostic tools for, um, for diseases. And in the case of NHLBI, as our name suggests, we are developing, we focus on developing new treatments, devices, diagnostics, et cetera, for patients with heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorders. So- Stephanie, um, in, I, I apologize sincerely for, for uh, interrupting here. No are worries, we, um, are we, feel free yeah, I, I just want to see- no, I just wanted to see if we were seeing your full slides. It looks like- Oh, it's... sorry. Um, hold on. Let me, let me try something. We're, we're seeing the slides for you, the speaker, but I don't know if we're seeing the slides for let us. Let me try one more time, Martin. I think it's okay. because I have extra monitors. Sometimes it'll do that. So- That happens to me too, by the way. See. Okay. Is, can you see my full screen now? Now we're cooking. Terrific. Thanks, Stephanie. Hey, Martin? Yep. I saw it there. So it looked like you did the right thing. Sorry, everybody. Now we're cooking. Martin, can you see it now? Yes. Yes, I can. How about you?
Can anybody hear me? We can hear you. If this doesn't work, by the way, Stephanie, go back to, to where you were and I promise I won't interrupt any further. Oh, Martin, I'm so sorry. Sorry, I, I completely, for whatever reason, my, my um, sound just went out so I couldn't hear any of that. Uh, let me try again with the screen share. Okay. Um, could you just repeat what you said? Because I think- uh, I, I was just out. simply saying that, that if you can't get into the full screen, uh, just go back to where you were. I, and, I, and I won't bug you anymore on it. All right. Let so me I think if you just take your cursor down, there, there we go. Now, now we can see it. That looks good. Okay, now you can see my full screen? Yes. Okay, I am so sorry about that. Um, no sometimes worries. because I have yeah. full monitors, it's a little difficult. Okay, and so if anyone has issues seeing my full screen, please let me know and I'll see if I can fix it. Um, anyway, so as I was saying, um, federal agencies last fiscal year were required to put aside 3.2% of their federal budget to the SBIR program and 0.45% of their budget to the STTR program. And the main focus of these programs is to provide small businesses with, re with funding that is required for research and development and the uh, commercialization of new technologies. However, the main difference between the two is that while the SBIR program allows small businesses to collaborate with nonprofit research institutions, the STTR program actually requires it. So that is the sister program that specifically is designed to facilitate collaboration between small businesses and US research institutions to develop commercialized technologies. So this past fiscal year, um, we had about $1.19 billion dedicated specifically towards both the SBIR and the STTR programs. So if you look at this pie chart, um, the yellow slice in the bottom of the page, that is for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So our budget last year was about one, uh, $117 million. Right now we are the fourth largest institute in terms of budget. Um, we are only exceeded by the National Cancer Institute, uh, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, and my former institute of the National Institute on Aging. So we have a very large SBIR and STTR budget that we, um, you know, have dedicated towards people who are developing new treatments and devices, et cetera, for people in the field of heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorders. And, and one more interruption. Sorry, Stephanie. It, it, to, are, are you controlling the slide advancement? Or I am. Are we, okay. Mm -hmm. I am. It does allow me to do that. Okay. So you, you'll need to do that. Fantastic. But thanks for checking. So um, if you're wondering whether or not you're for the SBIR or the STTR programs. Uh, here are the eligibility requirements on this slide. So I do want to give everybody a heads up that we do not, um, we do not have any control over the requirements. These are determined by the Small Business Administration. So um, unfortunately, we aren't allowed to make any exceptions to these rules. But generally speaking, in order to be eligible for the SBIR and STTR programs, you need to be an organized for-profit US-based small business concern with 500 or fewer employees, including affiliates. So most of the businesses we fund are startups. A lot of them are academic startups. So most of them have 500 or fewer employees. The work must be done in the US. Um, there are a few exceptions to this rule where businesses have had to subcontract out work to a foreign entity, but this usually requires a very strong scientific justification, as in like this facility that is um, located internationally is the only one in the world that can do this service. But generally speaking, we don't recommend it because it's a lot of paperwork and it's, it's kind of hard to get approval for that exception. Um, it must be more than 50% U.S. owned by individuals and independently operated, or uh, it must be more than 50% owned and controlled by another business that is greater than 50% owned and controlled by U.S.-based individuals. And in the case of SBIR programs only, if a business is more than 50% owned by multiple venture capital firms, 
the rule of thumb is that the business cannot be owned uh, more than 50% by a single VC firm. And one thing that's important to note is that for both SBIR and STCR programs, the award is always made to the small business. So even if there is a collaboration, the small business always um, gets the award. So what are the advantages to SBIR and STTR funding? Um, so a lot of people don't know this, but the NIH is actually one of the largest funding sources for early stage life sciences focused businesses in the US. Um, so if you receive an SBIR grant, you don't need to repay it. It's not a loan and it is non-dilutive. Non so it shouldn't impact uh, the sales or the prices of your stocks or shares. Also with an SBIR grant or an STTR grant, the small business is able to retain intellectual property rights, which is important, especially for STTR grants because normally when um, intellectual property is developed at an academic institution, the academic institution gets to maintain ownership due to the Bayh-Dole Act. But with an STTR program, there is an IP agreement that allows the small business to um, retain those IP rights. It also provides recognition uh, for your business and gives you credibility. So if you're seeking any sort of third party investment after receiving the award, it shows and demonstrates that you are able to um, show the commercialization, uh, the commercialized potential of your product. You're able to show that it meets an unmet clinical need. And you know this is very important when you're trying to attract other funding uh, in the future. So as I mentioned, there are some differences between the SBIR and the STTR programs. And the main difference between the two is that the SBIR program allows the small business concern to partner with a nonprofit research institution. The STTR program permits it. So um, another main difference between the two programs is that with an SBIR program, the primary employment of the PI must be with the small business. So with an STTR grant, that is not required. So the PI can be employed by either the research institution or the small business. And it's basically required that they have at least 10% effort on the project, but it's not required that they are employed primarily with the small business. So just keep in mind, if you are a faculty member at UCR or another one of the um, UC system universities, an STTR program might be the best fit for you if you are primarily employed with the university. And then finally, with the SBIR program, you are permitted to outsource 33% of your work in phase one and up to 50% of your work during phase two. With an STTR program, it is required that the small business does at least 40% of the work, while the research institution partner has to do at least 30% of the work. Now, the other 30% can be done by either one. That can be split between the two as well but it is required that um, both of those partners do at least the 40 and the 30%. So at the NIH, uh, we fund basically two and a half stages of the SBIR program. So there are, um, across federal agencies, there are what is known as phase one, phase two, and phase three grants. Um, so you see the phase three on the right side of the screen. I should note that NIH does not fund phase three. So what that means is that the NIH does not act as a buyer for, um, for the technology like it does at the DOD, for example. But what we do fund is we fund phase one studies, which are mostly proof of concept feasibility studies. And you know, we also fund phase two, which these are kind of expanded studies that are done after the initial proof of concept work. They focus on full research and development as well as uh, more towards the commercialization of the product. And likewise, we also fund some supplementary programs that are available to businesses that have completed the phase two or are currently in the phase two uh, portion of the program one of which is the uh, phase 2b program which can be um, this is a program that businesses can apply for after getting the phase two uh, it can provide up to three million dollars over three years uh, it does require the businesses to get matching funds from third-party investors so 
this is um, often a really good program for businesses that are almost independent, but not quite. And then likewise, there's also the commercialization readiness pilot program. Uh, not all institutes participate in there. Um, the NHLBI does, although I should note that we have a different um, budget cap. We don't provide 3 million over three years. We actually provide 500,000 over two years. But likewise, the advantage of this program is that it require, it allows for extra money towards activities that are normally not covered under the phase two or phase two B programs. And finally, there are some alternative options besides the regular phase one and phase two. There is the option to pursue a fast track grant option, which I call it the two for one special. It's where you apply for a phase one and a phase two at the same time and you don't need to reapply for the phase two, you can just transition to that portion of the project after you meet your phase one milestones. And there's also the direct to phase two program, which if, you're, if you are a business that has already done what would be equivalent to a phase one study, there is the option for you to apply directly to the phase two portion. And then you wouldn't have to repeat work that has already been done. You could just move directly into that phase two portion. So this infographic shows the different steps that are involved from the time that you submit your award until the time that it's funded. Um, so just kind of a brief overview, when you submit your award uh, through grants.gov, it's going to be assigned to an institute and center. So for example, um, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute is the IC that is uh, used for applications that focus on heart, lung, blood and sleep disorders and a scientific review group, which is con um, commonly known as a study section. So the study section contains a group of experts. Um, small business grants have their own study sections that contain experts with both business and research and development expertise. So when they receive your grant, they're going to evaluate it based on its scientific merit, um, its innovation, its significance, as well as its commercialization potential. And once all of the grants are rated, they're going to receive what's known as a priority score. And the priority score is one of those things where the lower it is, the better. So once it gets a priority score, you should know whether or not it's likely to be funded. Um, and if you're unsure about that, NIH program staff are usually happy to talk to you to kind of give you the funding prospects of your proposal. Well, when all of these grants receive priority scores, they're sent to the advisory council, which is going to generally recommend uh, approval for certain proposals to be funded. Afterwards, the NIH extramural staff will prepare a funding plan, they will allocate the funds, and then they will send out the notices of award. And this entire process can take anywhere from five months at the earliest to possibly up to 12 months if a resubmission is required. So, uh, we are trying to streamline the process as much as we can, but it is still government and I just wanted everyone to keep in mind that it's important to also pursue alternative sources of funding just to avoid any sort of funding gap between a phase one and a phase two award. So to give you all an idea of when you will actually be able to start your project date for each of the grant deadlines, um, small business grant proposals are accepted three times a year. So they commonly fall on January 5th, April 5th, and September 5th. Um, so when on each of these grant deadlines, the review meetings where the study section is going to go over and review your proposal usually occur about two months later. And then once all of the proposals are reviewed and the priority scores are given, all of these proposals will go to the advisory council round, which will be about another two months after that. And then once council makes their recommendations and the funding lists are prepared, um, usually a few more months after that, the project um, start date can occur. So um, just keep in mind with a lot of these deadlines, as you can see here, there's often anywhere from a five to seven month gap between when the due date for the proposal is and when your project can start. So you, you do want to prepare your application early just to make sure that you don't accidentally have a funding gap. So um, as I mentioned previously, um, the NHLBI Small Business Program is primarily interested in innovative and commercially promising products to prevent, treat, and diagnose conditions uh, related to heart, 
lung, blood, and sleep-related diseases. So if you can see the pie chart on the presentation, this kind of shows the general breakdown of what types of technologies we fund. So uh, most of our portfolio, 40% um, of what we fund is therapeutics. So these include small molecule drugs and biologics. About 31% goes to diagnostic devices, 16% goes to other devices, 7% goes to health IT and software products, and 5% goes to research tools. So this breakdown, it, it does vary from year to year. Um, and it really highly depends upon what kind of proposals we get and how they do in study section. But generally speaking, this is usually what our portfolio looks like. Um, right now, we have about 312 active projects in our portfolio, and our budget is sitting at around $117 million for this past fiscal year. We're hoping to have uh, you know, even more than that for next fiscal year. So most of our small business proposals come in through what's known as the omnibus funding opportunity announcements. So an omnibus funding opportunity announcement is um, initiated by the investigator and these are the ones that all of the institutes at the NIH participate in. So um, pretty much as long as it is covered by, as long as the topic proposal relates to the focus of that institute, it will be accepted. So we participate in all four of the omnibus funding opportunity announcements. Um, PA-20-260 is the SBIR proposal that does not allow a clinical trial. It has a sister FOA that does allow a clinical trial. Um, likewise, we also participate in two funding opportunity announcements for STTR proposals. Uh, PA-20-261 requires a clinical trial, while 20-265 does not allow for a clinical trial. Uh, one thing that is important to remember is that while we do fund clinical trial activities for phase one and phase two SBIR and STTR proposals, not all institutes at the NIH do. So it is important um, when you're looking into institutes that could potentially fund your proposal that you're aiming it at one that does allow for clinical trials. So the budget waivers, um, generally speaking, uh, across the federal agencies, there are some basic guidelines for phase one and phase two budget caps. So these guidelines are sitting currently at 150,000 for phase one proposals and 1 million over two years for phase two proposals. However, um, generally speaking, we have an agreement with the Small Business Administration that medical science related proposals such as the ones funded by the NIH are a lot more expensive than those that are funded by other federal agencies. So the NIH wide hard cap for budget proposals is actually 252,000 for a phase one and 1.68 million dollars for a phase two. However, the um, all of the institutes have what are known as waiver topics. So if you have a proposal that falls under one of the waiver topics that is specific to the institute, you can actually request even more money. So you can request up to $300,000 for your phase one and $2 million for your phase two. So in order to see whether or not you have a proposal that falls under a waiver topics, um, there is a link in the NIH topics for budget waivers. It is on our website, it's, it's free to the public, and it's something where if you can identify a waiver topic that your proposal falls under, you can request those higher caps. Um, it's also important to know that your SBIR budget is defined by the total cost and you do need to adhere to the subcontracting requirements. And each funding opportunity announcement has a different budget allowance. So the budget caps that are listed in this table are for the omnibus um, solicitations. There are some targeted funding opportunity announcements that might have different budget caps. You can request a 7% fee for your proposal. So the fee is basically your profit. Um, this is a percentage of the total budget and it is money that we're not gonna ask where it goes. So um, if you would like that 7% profit, please request so at the time of your proposal. 
Another thing that we often get asked about are fee-for-service activities. So if you are going to be outsourcing some of your work to a CRO, for example, um, a lot of people wonder if that counts as a small business cost or if it counts as subcontracting. So the answer to that question is, if it is a commercially available service, if all analyses are done by the small business, and if it is done on a fee per basis, it can count as small business costs. So the NHLBI not only has um, our small business program in the offices of Translational Alliance and Coordination, but OTAC, which is the office that I come from, also has several other advisory experts. So within the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination, we have entrepreneurs in residence, we have an investor in residence, we have intellectual property experts, and so all of these experts, I work with them very closely and they are here to provide you help. So um, there is a small business inquiry form. If you need any expertise in these areas, um, it's on our website and you are allowed to request it. Uh, one thing I did wanna highlight, for people who have never been successful in the um, NIH small business programs before, we have a new program, uh, relatively new, called the Applicant Assistance Program. So this is a free 10-week coaching program, um, and eight institutes participate, including NHLBI. So what it does provide is it provides a coach who's going to uh, help you prepare your phase one proposal and help review it. They will give you feedback on your specific aims page, and they will coach you through all of the necessary registrations. They, it is not a grant writing service and they won't actually develop and submit your plan for you, but it is a, a very useful service to help provide guidance to people who are less familiar with the NIH small business program. And we specifically developed this program to kind of make people more familiar with the process, uh, specifically that are businesses owned by women and individuals that are historically underrepresented in the life sciences. So if you'd like more information, um, there is an, a web page that contains all of the information about it, and we are anticipating the next submission portal to open around December. We also have a program called the Catalyze Program, which is run by the former small business coordinator, so my predecessor. And basically, the Catalyze Program is designed to provide uh, de-risking type services for early technologies. So this infographic shows kind of the product definition type activities and preclinical activities that are provided under the Catalyze program. And if you see the link at the bottom, there are more details about the funding opportunity announcements associated with Catalyze. So specifically, some of the funding opportunities that Catalyze covers, including product definition for small molecules and biologics, as well as product definition for devices. So um, I realized that that deadline is out of date. The next deadline is actually in March 9th of 2021. But um, if you're interested in these services and you would like you know, some product definition for either your early stage small molecules or early stage devices, this might be worth looking into. And I'd be happy to connect you to my colleague. So um, if you are a first time applicant, these are some of the most necessary resources that are available on the NIH website. So we have sets of sample SBIR grant applications, which if you'd like to know what a successful SBIR grant looks like, we have um, our sister institute, the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, has several well-ranked grant applications that you can look at. We also have the SF424, which is basically the SBIR STTR application manual. So it's 170 pages long, but it answers almost every question you might have related to submitting an SBIR or STTR application. We also have an annotated form set for SBIR grant applications. So if you are in the process of filling out your application online, this is a really useful thing to have. We have a, an application process infographic, which kind of shows the entire process. We also have a database called NIH Reporter. For those that are not familiar, this contains all of the NIH supported research projects that are currently being funded. And there's kind of a subsite called Matchmaker, which if you want to see, you know, what institute or what other projects might be 
you know, similar to yours, or if you want to see what institute your project might be a good fit for, Matchmaker is a really good tool to kind of figure that out. And also, we have a YouTube channel under the NHLBI YouTube playlist called Small Business Hangouts. So I, I uh, inserted a link to the Hangouts, and these provide um, really fun, very informative videos about regulatory support, commercialization support, and intellectual property expertise. So if you'd like to get on our uh, email list, just email listserv at list.nih.gov, and you want to put that you want to subscribe to the SBIR and STTR news. Um, if you'd like to follow the NIH small business Twitter account, just follow at NIH SBIR. And if you'd like to contact us specifically at NHLBI, just follow us at NHLBI underscore SBIR or email us at NHLBI underscore SBIR at mail.nih.gov. And thank you all very much for your attention. Stephanie, terrific. There you go. Now we're, now we're cooking. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, oh, yeah, thank you. Sorry for the, uh, the, the hiccup, uh, but we oh, no worries. had a chance to. <laughs> yeah. So for everyone out there, um, especially those of you who have a heart or lungs or blood flowing through your body, this is a terrific opportunity to come up with questions. And so put your questions on chat and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll jump on it. And uh, thanks, Aaron. It, it was indeed a very good presentation, no doubt about that. Stephanie, uh, while we're waiting for the questions to start to start showing up, and and they will, one of the questions that Misty and I get a lot mm -hmm. um, has to do with indirect costs. Yes. Uh, as as a percentage of direct costs and so forth, and the question that we're always asked is. Are the indirect costs, are they a part of the whole budget? You had mentioned a budget of, uh, I think, 150 or with the waiver, $252,000 and so forth. So the indirect cost, is that included as part of the 150? And likewise, to tackle that uh, even further, the 7% profit margin, is that also a part of the 150 or 252,000 waiver? Yes, so um, the 7% is a portion of the total costs. And when we talk about the budget caps, we're referring to the, the total cost of the awards. So that includes both the direct costs and those are the ones that are directly um, kind of linked to the research and development type activities of the award and then the indirect or the FNA costs. So normally um, there is, Normally, the indirect cost rate is, it kind of ranges between 35% and 40%. Um, the key with those is that they cannot, like any indirect rates cannot be related to the activities done in the award. So um, if you have, if the business has previously um, negotiated a rate, they can put that, but usually it's between 35 and 40%. But um, when we talk about the total budget, like the, the budget caps, we're talking about the total budget. Got it. Okay, terrific. And uh, we have a question from Juana. Juana, great minds must think alike or something close to that because I was going to ask exactly the same question. So I appreciate that. First of all, Juana says great presentation. Ditto on that one. Yeah. And thanks. Ditto. Likewise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Juana wanted to ask if you could maybe expand more on the Catalyze program, as did I. And uh, I, I am kind of, sort of, but not really, or we are uh, with the CRP program. So yes. I'm guessing there's a difference. There and, is a difference between yeah. the two. So Catalyze is run by my colleague, Dr. Mike Peck. He is a fantastic individual who did a, a stellar job running the SBIR program. So I have some very big shoes to fill with him but he had a really great opportunity to start running the Catalyze program. So the Catalyze program is, it's a lot different than the CRP because while the CRP is more designed for businesses that are already a little bit further along in their commercial development, the Catalyze program is designed for mainly academic innovators and people that are very, very early on in the commercialization stage. 
and it's designed to give them opportunities to develop their products. So it covers a lot of different R&D type activities related to devices, to biologics, to small molecules. Um, I would be more than happy if anyone's interested in this program to put you in touch with Mike, um, since he is the expert on that. But basically it's designed for very early stage. Um, a lot of times, you know, people who are interested in this program haven't even started a company yet. So, you know, if you have some sort of intellectual property that you've developed at your university and you have not yet started out a company, but you're thinking that you might want to commercialize it, the Catalyze is a good program for you. What's the timing of those? When do we apply for the, uh, both either one of them respectively, by the way? So the CRP, um, that one follows the standard deadlines. So the January, the, May, um, the April, and the September deadlines. The Catalyze program, the next deadline is in March, um, actually. So I believe it's March and July. I have to double check, but the next one should be March 9th, 2021. Those are both on your website. I'm yes. pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and Jared has a question. Um, Stephanie, do you fund things related to lung or blood cancers or would that go through the NCI? Um, good question. Um, so, we fund pretty much anything that is, um, you know, non-cancerous. So NCI basically gets all of the cancers. Anything else related to heart, lung, blood, and sleep, we fund. But that is, that is kind of a common issue. There are some times where, you know, if there's like a hematological cancer-focused SBIR, um, you know, we'll be listed as a secondary institute where, you know, if for whatever reason NCI wasn't able to fund it, we'd be able to. That's unlikely though, because NCI's budget is uh, enormous. But, but yeah, so heart failure, COPD, myocardial infarction, uh, sleep apnea, um, anemia, sickle cell disease. Those are some of the conditions we cover. If you're unsure about it, please send me an email and I'd be happy to direct you as to whether or not um, we'd be the best fit or if another IC would be. Um, also, I wanted to add something about the CRPs. Thank you to my colleague, Anne Marie, who works as, um, she is one of our budget experts. The CRP is available if you have either already done a phase two or phase two B, or you're currently in a phase two or phase two B. So it's a really great program. It provides uh, extra funding and does not have subcontracting restrictions. So for example, uh, as I mentioned before, if you have an SBIR, phase two award, you can only outsource up to 50%. If you have a CRP award that kind of goes on top of your parent award, you can use the CRP money to, you know, if for example, you have activities that need to be performed that have to be outsourced, you can outsource almost all of it if you have a justification and you don't have to keep it within that 50%. Got it. That helps a lot. And uh, you, I, I think, Stephanie, you had already answered this question, at least in part, when you were discussing the, the omnibus solicitations and so forth. But, but Vered was asking, are, are, you, are there any specific priorities that, that you folks are uh, looking at right now or have the greatest interest in terms of therapeutics? Yes. So um, if you would like, um, basically, that, uh, Martin, just quick question. Are we gonna be, um, would you like, would you be able to send out my presentation afterwards to all of the attendees? We would love to, and we okay. are receiving tons of requests to do that. Okay, so, yeah, the reason they, why I ask yeah. is because um, the waiver topics that I linked to in my presentation, that shows our main areas of interest. So um, as Got you it. all can imagine, now that, you know, COVID is a global pandemic. We have probably gotten a lot more applications that uh, focus on the pulmonary complications of COVID. However, um, you know, we are always looking for um, any sort of therapeutics that treat diseases of interest that affect the heart, lungs, blood, or if they um, are related to sleep disorders. But the waiver topics should show you where our areas of greatest priority are. Got it. 
And uh, Jared had another question. I don't know if you see that that uh, that title hovering over your head, but he wondered if uh, you he'd like to hear a little bit more about translational technology department and so forth. That's my tongue in cheek way of referring to the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination, which is hovering over your head there. So he'd like yeah. to learn a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. So um, the OT OTAC or the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination. So although the small business program is housed within um, the OTAC, OTAC doesn't just cover the small business program. So for example, um, one of the things that our office has historically done is we have been the administration and the coordinating center for academic proof of concept networks, such as the NCAI program, um, and that actually has um, academic hubs at the Cleveland Clinic at, in Boston, as well as California. Um, and these are proof of concept centers that are designed to help academic entrepreneurs develop new technologies for treating heart, lung, blood, and sleep associated diseases. Yeah. Um, up until recently, um, now the main NIH seed office is running the REACH program, but the REACH program is a more disease agnostic We've also helped run that. So, you know, we, in addition to small business programs, we've also been very active in helping academic innovators develop their technologies, even if they don't have a business. We've been really involved with that. We also have um, people like Steve Flame, Luis Gutierrez, Gautam Burkesh, uh, Kwame Ulmer, most recently. He's our new regulatory expert. So in addition to providing small business grants, we also provide entrepreneurial, regulatory, and intellectual property expertise. So that's what our team of experts is there for, to kind of provide advice to not only our companies, but they also um, have helped the seed office with providing coaching to companies and other institutes as well. So we are not just focused on the small business program, we're also, expanding our reach to academic researchers who are interested in translating their technologies from the bench to the bedside. Terrific. Thanks. It's great to hear you mention Steve Flame again. Anyway, uh, Jayu asked a question, Stephanie, and the answer is is obviously a yes and, and yes again, but uh, He's asking, do you fund COVID-19 projects? And, and, <laughs> and, and, and actually, actually where, where are you right now on that, as a matter of fact? So uh, it's funny, funny that, um, that that got brought up because, you know, normally we have a certain percentage of our portfolio, which goes towards heart-focused, uh, heart lung-focused, blood-focused technologies. And just this year alone, looking at the projects that we have awarded, there are significantly more that are lung focused because almost no doubt because of COVID-19. So both us and the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, we both have a heavy focus on COVID related technologies. NIAD tends to focus a little bit more on like the diagnostic um, aspect. So if you're developing a new technology for detecting COVID, the SARS-CoV-2, then it's probably more of interest to them. But we are very focused on looking specifically at like the pulmonary and blood type complications. So for example, you know, seeing people with clotting problems after getting infected with SARS-CoV-2 or people who have decreased lung, uh, you know, decreased lung function after getting infected with SARS-CoV-2. So if you have a proposal related to COVID, please contact me. I'd be happy to help you figure out which of the institutes it would be of interest for. But if it has anything to do with, uh, you know, COVID's effect on lung function, it would most definitely be either good for us as the primary institute or at least as the secondary. Got it. Thanks. And Juana has another question as well, and I'll do my very best to paraphrase if I can. And, and Juana, if I do you justice, uh, let, let me know. So she wants to know whether uh, her uh, potentially transformative innovation might be of uh, a, a good one to submit to you prospectively anyway. Um, her focus is on diabetes, but a secondary medical condition that she'd like to measure lies in the heart, lung, blood area. Is that something that may prospectively be worthwhile uh, sending your way for consideration? 
I mean, absolutely. So generally speaking, if diabetes is the primary comp, uh, if it's the primary disease focus, NIDDK would probably be the best primary institute. But we do have projects in our portfolio that are related to, for example, cardiovascular complications. So like diabetic cardiomyopathy is yep. one disease where we focus on a lot because we're looking more at the cardiac complications. Um, but we, I highly recommend just reaching out to us and seeing whether or not it's a good fit. Because even if it's, even if our, uh, your project maybe wouldn't be the best fit for NHLBI, all of the small business program coordinators are connected and we will refer you to one of our colleagues who is at the appropriate IC. So please reach out. I will be happy to help you. Terrific. Thank you for that. And Aran has a question and, and I, I, it's with regard to letters of intent or letters of inquiry. And mm -hmm. um, uh, this is a topic that Misty and I have with almost all of our SBDC Epic clients here. And sometimes agencies will say, well, gee, Martin or Misty, you don't have to do it. And we say, yeah, mm -hmm. but is it a good idea? And we always say, yeah, it probably is a good idea. And it's worked out very well, quite frankly. I wanted to hear from you, uh, Stephanie, as did Aaron, of course. Um, number one, good idea. LOIs, do, or do you require it now? Uh, have things changed? And, and if you and, and if you determine, uh, or your one of your colleagues that it's maybe not responsive or something that might be a good fit for you, can you offer guidance to the PI in identifying um, how it may fit with you? I'm, I'm just inserting that on, on my own yeah, volition, sure. Aaron, or or whether there are other programs that might be a better fit for that. So um, to answer the LOI question, it, it really depends on the funding opportunity announcement. So um, once you all get the presentation, uh, it has links to several of the funding opportunity announcements that I mentioned, which includes all four of the omnibus ones, as well as the catalyzed focus um, request for applications. So if you scroll down through the entire um, funding opportunity announcement, Towards the bottom, it will show you whether an LOI is required or not. If it's not required, I wouldn't recommend spending a lot of time on it just because, you know, putting together an application is a bit of a time consuming process. I, I find in my experience, they tend to be more required uh, more often for targeted funding opportunity announcements. So for the catalyzed ones, um, I don't know for sure. I have to check that one, it might be more likely to have one as opposed to the omnibus solicitations. So as for the guidance, the, ge the general way that um, NHLBI is structured is that I, while I run the small business program, I do not manage the portfolio. I work very closely with scientific program officers who do manage the grants. So the way it works is when someone contacts me, I usually schedule like a 30 minute phone call and I'll talk about whether or not, you know, their grant is a good fit for us, whether it's a good fit for another institute. And I provide more general feedback on like, you know, the content of the specific aims or, you know, whether or not their budget is realistic or whether their time period is realistic. For the more scientific components of the application, I usually tend to um, refer the applicant to one of my colleagues in the scientific divisions because they are the subject matter experts. I am not. Um, I am responsible for answering program related questions, but my scientific colleagues, they will provide you with like the really uh, targeted feedback based on the scientific merits of your proposal. And I highly recommend for anybody who is considering um, submitting a small business proposal, reach out to me and schedule a call and also be sure to reach out to the appropriate program officer and schedule a call with them once I make the reference because a lot of people find that talking to program staff it really increases their chances of getting a good score and getting funded because they know how the reviewers think and they know what kind of uh, material is going to be really important for your grant to be scored well. Terrific. One final question, and it's a topic that both Misty and I are intrigued with. It's your applicant assistant program, AAP. We actually have a, uh, 
been uh, working, uh, albeit briefly, with a researcher from UC Irvine who actually went through that and, and uh, loved it. Oh, uh, fantastic. She said it, she said it was very valuable to her. She still struggles with her application, but probably would have had, had even uh, larger struggles without the AAP. This is one-on-one -on -one con consultation, or is it group, or how does that work out? It's one-on-one. -on -one. So the way it works is that um, applying to the AAP is pretty simple. So you just have to fill out a short application and provide a one-page summary of your technology and your proposal. So what happens is, is that we will go and select the applications that are the best fit for the program. We'll let everybody know if they get selected or not. Then once the applicants get selected, they will be paired with a coach from our contractor, which is a company called Eva Garland Consulting. And sure. their coaches are generally life science experts who specialize in helping people submit successful grants. And then they will kind of walk them through all of the necessary registrations. They will give them feedback on their proposal. Um, they will connect, they, they will also work with the scientific program staff members to provide feedback on the specific aims page. So it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one, um, program. And even before COVID, it was all done like on conference calls and Zoom calls, et cetera, so. Okay, terrific, I love it. Love to learn more about it. Misty, you had indicated that we have someone, I do not see uh, his or her hand raised. Could you? So um, Catherine, yeah. I'm gonna allow you to talk if you'd like to ask your question. Just unmute yourself, Catherine. We're kind of shy. We're introverted here, Stephanie. So sometimes. That's even, okay. Yeah, even when we raise our hands, we may not ask a question. Um, okay. Uh, so, Catherine, uh, if if you if if you wish, uh, please feel free to to type in your question through chat, and, and we'll get we'll definitely get back to you. Stephanie, I have no idea how this happened, but we have exhausted our time. What the uh, heck? Time flies yeah. when you're having well, fun, though. Well, well, fooey. And Anne-Marie, thank you very much indeed for, for listening in. And uh, so uh, our time is up. And thank you very much indeed. This was fantastic, Stephanie, and we are grateful. Uh, for you to to spend an hour with, and I know that you and Anne Marie now need to transition and in, into your one on one meetings and so forth. So we need to give you time to do that. So thank you very much, much appreciated, uh, extremely interesting and valuable. So we'll let you go and.